Hi, this is Mike Gabeman with some more KSP math. Let's paint a scenario. I have a probe in an 80 kilometer orbit about Kerbin that I would like to insert into a 500 kilometer circular orbit about the moon. What's it going to cost? I know, I know, I've got the Delta V maps, but if you look closely, they talk about the cost of insertion into a 14 kilometer orbit about the moon, not 500. I mean, I guess I could go with the numbers on the map and then add the cost of a Hohmann transfer out to 500 kilometers, but clearly that can't be the best way to accomplish this. And what about other bodies in the game? Well, let's do the math. Before we get started, I just want to remind people not to hesitate to hit those like and subscribe buttons. And if you really like what you're seeing here and want to ensure that it continues for a long, long time, I do have a Patreon page. Link in the description. Okay. I actually have talked about injection costs before when returning from Minmus. And in essence, the process is exactly the same. And if you want to try this yourself, watch that video and see if you can apply the technique to this situation. But I do promise you, we are going to go a little deeper here by exploring if the mysterious Oberth effect will be of any use to us. Let's get started. We'll start by going over the formulas that we'll use. First are the all too familiar vis viva equations. I first developed these in episode 2 and have used them repeatedly ever since. If you are unfamiliar with them, you may want to check that episode out. These formulas calculate the delta V requirements for burns in a Hohmann transfer. Delta V1 is at the lower altitude while delta V2 is at the higher altitude. R1 and R2 are the respective orbital radii, measured from the parent body center of those two altitudes. While mu, the letter that looks like a U with a tail, is the standard gravitational constant of that body. A number you can look up in-game in the tracking station or on the KSP wiki. Finally, the A is the semi-major axis, which is simply the average of the two orbital radii. Up next is another familiar formula. This calculates the orbital velocity of an object in a circular orbit of radius r. Again, mu is the standard gravitational constant of the parent body. The last formula we need is this one, which again first appeared in episode 2 and has come up once or twice since. It comes straight out of the conservation of energy law from physics and relates the orbital velocities and radii between any two points in a trajectory that is solely under the influence of gravity. The trajectory need not be in orbit, but can also be a hyperbolic path passing through the parent body's sphere of influence. I'm going to refer to this formula as the energy conservation law. With all that in place, let's get at it. Job one is to get ourselves out to the moon. This is a straight up Hohmann transfer from our 80 kilometer orbit about Kerbin, radius of 680,000 meters, to the moon, radius of 12 million meters. This is exactly what the vis viva equations are built for. Again, the semi-major axis is just the average of the orbital radii, which in this case gets us 6,340,000 meters. This is the lower altitude burn, so we use the first vis viva equation to get a required burn of 856 meters per second. Next, we need the speed relative to the moon, at which we will be encountering its sphere of influence. We'll call this V1. This velocity would be the velocity we would need to add on to match the orbital velocity of the moon, which is exactly what we get from the second vis viva equation. Sticking in our same values as before gets 365 meters per second. Of course, we aren't performing a burn here. Our burn will be performed at our 500 kilometer closest approach to the moon. What we need is our velocity at this point. For that, we're going to use the energy conservation law. My V1 is the 365 meters per second at which I'm entering the moon's SOI, while R1 is the radius of the moon's sphere of influence. R2 is then the radius of our closest approach. Remember, all these distances have to be measured from the moon's center. Mu is now the standard gravitational parameter for the moon. We can rearrange our formula for V2 to get this. Putting in our numbers and pushing through a calculator gets a V2 of 515 meters per second. We're almost there. The delta V of our required burn to circularize here is simply the amount of velocity we need to shed to get the circular orbital velocity at this altitude. 
So we take out our orbital velocity formula, stick in the radius at 500 kilometers, pull out a calculator to get 305 meters per second. This means that our capture burn would be 515 minus 305, yielding 210 meters per second. It's worth noting at this point that this is significantly less than the capture burn for a low lunar orbit given to us by this common delta V map. You might assume that captures keep getting cheaper as altitude increases, which is almost right. But actually, the cheapest capture around the moon happens at a little over 1400 kilometers, and then the cost starts creeping back up again. I should also mention that these kinds of calculations always end up making some assumptions at certain points. The most significant one here is that the speed at which I encounter the moon's SOI is our speed at apoapsis relative to the moon. But we actually enter the moon's sphere of influence a little before we reach apoapsis. As a result, our speed will be a little bit more than 365 that I calculated. As we'll actually be going faster than this, the real capture cost will be a bit more, but just a bit. But that's a topic for another time. What I want to explore now is, can I do better than 210 meters per second for our capture? What about this Oberth effect I keep hearing about? The Oberth effect becomes more pronounced the closer I get to the parent body. What would be our capture cost if instead we reduced our closest approach to as low as we dared, say 10 kilometers? This doesn't cost anything, as all we have to do is adjust the timing of the initial injection burn. We get our capture at the lower altitude but stop when our apoapsis hits 500 kilometers. Then circularize at apoapsis to get our desired orbit. Okay, this takes one more burn, but does the sum of those two burns come out to be less than 210 meters per second? Well, let's find out. Okay, we can calculate the cost of a circular capture at 10 kilometers now. It is the exact same process as before, except with an R2 of 210,000 meters rather than 700,000 meters. Using the conservation of energy law, we would get our speed at 10 kilometers before capture to be 837 meters per second. Our circular orbital velocity at 10 kilometers would be 557 meters per second. Once again, the capture cost would be the difference between these two, which gets 280 meters per second. But hang on, I don't want my capture to be circular. I want my apoapsis to be at 500 kilometers. We fix this by using the first VIS-VV equation to calculate the burn that would be necessary to push our apoapsis from 10 kilometers to 500 kilometers. This number represents the amount we overcooked during our capture, so we just have to subtract this off our capture cost. The VIS-VV equation gives us 134 meters per second. Subtracting this off the 280 gets a capture burn of just 146 meters per second. But we're not done yet. Now we have to calculate the cost of the circularization burn at apoapsis. That's just the second VIS-VV equation. Substituting in the numbers once again and pushing through a calculator gets that it needs to be 98 meters per second. Using this technique, we have two burns that sum to 244 meters per second. 34 meters per second more than just doing the direct capture. Kind of looks like using the Oberth effect as hogwash when it comes to getting captures. Well, hang on. We've only looked at one example. There may be times when it's still better to come in close to the parent body first. To help us answer this question, let's shift our attention to Minmus and calculate the cost of a 500 kilometer capture there. The process is exactly the same, so I'm going to go through this significantly faster. Just pause the video if you want to go over any of the calculations in more detail yourself. And don't hesitate to ask questions in the comments. First, there's the injection burn from LKO using the first VIS-VIVA equation, which gets a burn of 921 meters per second. Next, we use the second VIS-VIVA equation to calculate 228 meters per second for our encounter speed with Minmus' SOI. Shifting our frame of reference to Minmus, we then use the mechanical energy formula to calculate what our speed would be at closest approach. 238 meters per second. Mimis just doesn't speed us up like the moon does. Step four is to calculate the orbital velocity at 500 kilometers, 56 meters per second, which we subtract off to get a capture burn of 100, 182 meters per second. So that was the direct capture approach. What about taking advantage of the Oberth effect? 
we now make our closest approach 10 kilometers. Using the mechanical energy formula at this altitude now gives us a velocity of 318 meters per second. We need to get to a velocity of 159 meters per second for a circular orbit here, which means that our capture to circularize would be, well, coincidentally, also 159 meters per second. Of course, we don't want a circular orbit here, but rather an apoapsis of 500 kilometers. Using the Visviva equation again tells us that we overcooked by 53 meters per second. Subtracting that off tells us that our capture need only be 106 meters per second. Finally, using Visviva one last time, we calculate the cost to circularize at 500 kilometers, getting 30 meters per second, yielding a sum for the two burns of 136 meters per second. This time, 46 meters per second less than the direct capture approach. This time, the Oberth effect resulted in a cheaper capture. Huh. So why the different outcome? For a 500 kilometer capture about the moon, it was cheaper to go for the direct capture. But for the exact same orbit around Minmus, it was cheaper to sweep in close first. But why? Well, I'm going to have to leave that for a topic for a future episode. But in the meantime, if you have a thought, I would love to see it down in the comments. And we will continue this discussion there. But for now, as always, I want to thank you for watching and hope to see you again next time.